Well, good morning to everyone. Welcome back to day two of our conference. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the lectures yesterday as well as Dr. Barcelo's lecture this morning, which his lecture will be very much complementary uh, to what I want to present uh, during this hour because we're going to focus on the Abrahamic covenant and its relation to the mystery of Christ, the development of the mystery of Christ in the scriptures. Yesterday we looked at a lot of historical theology and this lecture is not focused at all on historical theology. It's rather much more focused on the text of Scripture itself. And we're going to be surveying a lot of different texts. So if you have your Bibles handy, that would be very useful so that you can look at the text of Scripture with me and consider what the Word of God says in various places. Um, one of the things that... One of the things that often comes up in debates or discussions or studies of covenant theology is, is a situation such as this where let's say that we have a Pado baptist brother who was listening yesterday and they say, I agree with everything that you said insofar as it relates to the Mosaic covenant, but I do not agree with you insofar as it relates to the Abrahamic covenant. And that's really why we need to discuss the Abrahamic Covenant in a distinct way from what we discussed yesterday in relation to the Mosaic Covenant. And most of my lectures or sermons or books often have a very detailed outline, which is Im important. But this, this lecture really doesn't have a detailed outline. It's kind of one long, sustained argument from a variety of different passages uh, in the style of Paul in Hebrews. <laughs> Uh, Paul makes one long argument drawing from all kinds of texts. As, as it says here, as it says there, as someone somewhere said, all sorts of things to make one large argument. And that's really what I want to do, uh, or the same kind of argumentation is what I want to sustain this morning. So if you want an outline, it's the lecture title, The Mystery of Christ and the Abrahamic Covenant. That's what the entire lecture is about from start to finish. Now, I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 12 as an introduction to the concept of mystery and the mystery of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 12. The Apostle Paul says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. In these verses, Paul mentions mystery various times, and he refers specifically to the mystery of Christ. So what is a mystery in the biblical sense? We would think of, of a mystery as uh, something that's unknown, something to be solved, uh, like a murder mystery. You don't know what it is, or it's something that is hidden from you. Whereas mystery in the biblical sense, mystery as Paul uses it and as it is used elsewhere in the scriptures, mystery is a category of revelation. Mystery is a way of communicating things. A mystery is something that is revealed, but it's revealed partially or incompletely 
or obscurely or darkly. It's not revealed clearly, but it is revealed. And Paul tells us that the mystery of Christ is that the nations of the world would receive salvation freely through faith in the gospel. That all the nations of the world, all the nations and peoples of this earth, will receive salvation freely through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, now, in, in his day, in our time, everyone knows this. Now it has been publicly declared, it has been brought into reality in history. Paul has said that Jesus Christ has realized, he has brought to reality the eternal purpose of God. And he has said, Paul has said that the apostles are now fully and openly declaring this to everyone. All who come to Jesus Christ by faith will be saved. Now we could ask the question, is this new? Is this new? And this is why Dr. Barcella's previous lecture is very, very uh, helpful preparation for this lecture. We know that this is not new. It is a mystery that is now unveiled in fullness, but it was previously revealed in the Old Testament as a mystery. Paul says in verse 5, he says that it was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed. He doesn't say that it was not made known, but that it was not made known in the same way. We have now a clearer revelation, a clearer understanding of what was previously revealed, but was previously revealed as a mystery. Paul calls it an eternal purpose. God has an eternal purpose, a plan, which was revealed as a mystery in the ages past, but is now unveiled and explained in clarity and glory, declared to the whole world by the apostles and the church. What this means, therefore, is that there is a unity in God's revelation. The Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, all speak of the same thing. They all have this eternal purpose and plan of God running through everything that God has revealed, as well as the, history, the unfolding history of redemption. And this unity in God's revelation is what we would call, what Paul calls, the mystery of Christ. That Christ is revealed in the Old Testament mysteriously, and Christ is unveiled and revealed in the New Testament clearly and gloriously. And Paul is saying that God has given a special grace to him, a special gift to him. Paul says, God has gifted me by revelation, by the Spirit, to understand this mystery and to make it known to the Gentiles. Paul even helped the other, the other apostles to understand it. Jesus had promised that his Holy Spirit would be given in greater measure to the apostles so that they would understand these things. And Paul was a part of that unfolding, that unveiling, that revealing, and Paul helped even the other apostles to better understand and apply these things. Paul's special calling was to take this to the Gentiles. We may joke or, or tease about Paul being the author of the letter to the Hebrews, but I, I really do believe that, not that I would press anyone to believe that, but when Paul says that he has a special grace and gift to understand the Old Testament and show the mystery of Christ from it, and we read Hebrews, and you have a, an author who is reading the Old Testament text with such insights into it that he can make arguments like the one from Psalm 40 and say, look how this reveals the incarnation uh, promised to us and the work of Christ which was to come. And the writer makes similar argumentation about how Psalm 110 is revealed after the institution of the Levitical priests. The Levitical priesthood is already established. And then in later revelation, you have this promise of another priest. The writer to the Hebrews says that tells you there's a new covenant coming that will make the old one obsolete. And he's looking at just the timing of the revealing of Psalm 110 after the, the decree of the the oath to the son about priesthood comes later than the institution of the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, you know, there is a new priesthood coming and a new covenant coming, etc. Who had those kinds of insights? Who, by the power of the Spirit, looked into the Old Testament in such a way and could, could clearly explain and unveil it for the peoples? Well, it's Paul above all. Not Paul exclusively, but Paul above all. 
And in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, Paul is appealing to the Ephesians saying, when you read what I tell you about the mystery of Christ, when you read what I say about Jesus in the Old Testament, you will perceive what God has gifted and graced me with in order to understand this and make it known. Paul speaks of the same thing in Colossians. He even asks the Colossians to pray for him. He says, pray for me that I might be able to make known the mystery of Christ. He says that he is making known fully the word of God. He is unveiling the mystery. Now, how did Paul do this? How did Paul explain the mystery of Christ? Or how did the other apostles explain the mystery of Christ? You see, one of the obstacles that they faced was to prove that, that the apostles and the church were the authentic and legitimate successor of the Old Testament. The Jews said, no, this is false. The church and its apostles and, and all of it, it's Christ. This is not what the Old Testament was bringing us to. The Jews said, this is not where the Old Testament takes us. And the apostles and the church, they were arguing, no, the church and the Christ, what has happened in history is precisely what the Old Testament was always designed to, to bring about in history and terminate in. So the apostles, to prove this, they go to the prophets, they go to the law of Moses, and they prove that the sufferings and subsequent glories of the Messiah were already revealed in the Old Testament as a mystery. And they argue that God's dealings with Israel, and especially the precise way in which God's dealings with Israel are recorded in the scriptures, were designed to terminate in the Christ and his covenant and his kingdom. The apostles are going to argue that this promise of free salvation in the Jewish Christ for all nations is not new. It's not a detour from the law. It's not a detour from the prophets. It's the destination of the law and the destination of the prophets. And so they go to the text of scripture. They go back to the Old Testament and they prove it from the Old Testament to the Jews. This is what Paul did when he would go into the synagogues and it says that he reasoned with them from the law of Moses or he reasoned with them from the law and the prophets arguing about the kingdom of God or persuading them that Jesus is the Christ. If you want to convince Jews that the church is the authentic and legitimate successor of the Old Testament scriptures and history, what is the best place to go or where is the best place to go? Well, Paul consistently goes to Abraham. Paul consistently goes to Abraham, not only to Abraham, but very frequently. Because if you want to know if you want to understand Jewish identity, you begin with Abraham because that's where Jewish identity begins. And Paul's going to argue that from the very beginning of God's dealings with Abraham, the purpose and plan always was to bless all the nations of the earth in his offspring. So when the, when the offspring of Abraham comes and blesses all the nations, Jews, you can't object to this. This is precisely why God called us into existence. This is precisely why God gave us the covenants and the kingdom, which he did. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but just letting you understand the, the, the contours of the argument that we're going to develop. So what we've done is introduce the concept of mystery as a category of revelation. We've seen that Paul refers to the mystery of Christ, which was previously revealed, but not in the same way. And now it is being fully unveiled and explained and declared to the world through the apostles and the church. And one of the reasons why they do this is to show to the Jews that the, the Christ and his church, the Christ and his covenant and his kingdom are the authentic and legitimate successor of the, of the law and the prophets and the writings of the Old Testament. Now consider with me more specifically the Abrahamic covenant in relation to the mystery of Christ. How should we understand the relation of the Abrahamic covenant to the mystery of Christ. And I want to state two theses or two propositions that we will return to and continue to use over and over throughout the rest of this lecture. So if you're taking notes, write down these two things. Number one, <clears throat> the Abrahamic covenant promised the advent of the Christ according to the flesh. 
The Abrahamic covenant promised the advent of the Christ according to the flesh. And the second thing is that the Abrahamic covenant promised that the Christ would bring a new covenant. The Abrahamic covenant promised that the Christ would bring a new covenant. What we're going to see is that the Abrahamic covenant produces the Christ according to the flesh. And the Christ brings the new covenant. Now, to what am I referring when I say that the Abrahamic covenant promises the Christ according to the flesh and promises that the Christ will bring a new covenant with him? To what am I referring? And this is where we're going to begin our scripture survey. So would you please open your Bibles or turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12? Dr. Barcelos helpfully pointed out that the promises of the gospel predate the Israelite covenants. And so what is what's going to take place in Genesis 12 has a preceding context. Genesis 12 is going to carry forward something that God had already revealed. Genesis 12 verse 3, God says to Abraham, God says to Abram at that time, and in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God is saying to Abraham, in you, Abraham, through you, from you, there will come a blessing for all the families, all the nations of the earth. Remember that prior to God coming to Abram and, and making known these promises and covenanting with him, there was no nation of Israel. There were no covenants with the line of Abraham. There was no kingdom of Israel. It is God's dealings with Abram and the unfolding of his covenant dealings with him that establishes the people of Israel through covenant to make them a kingdom. And so God here is setting up the Israelite kingdom through the covenant with Abraham, and God is from the very beginning saying your purpose as a covenant people your purpose as a kingdom is to produce from your line a blessing for all the nations now turn over to chapter 22 and verse 18 we have the same promise slightly altered in in language genesis 22 verse 18 God says to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So notice two things here. We have on the one hand the promise that there will be a descendant who blesses. That's, the, that's what I mean when I say that the Abrahamic covenant promises the advent of the Messiah according to the flesh. God covenants with Abraham that one of your offspring, one of your descendants, through natural generation, someone will be born from your line who will bless the nations. So we have a promise of the advent of Christ according to the flesh. But notice on the other hand, the blessing that this descendant brings. There is the promise of the advent of the one who blesses. And then there is the blessing that this one brings. And those two things are, of course, related, but they are distinct God says, Abraham, from you will come one who blesses. And the one who blesses will bless the nations. And so that's what I mean when I say that the Abrahamic covenant promises the advent of the Christ according to the flesh. You will have the one that blesses. And the Abrahamic covenant promises that the one who blesses will bring the new covenant to the nations. The new covenant is the blessing for the nations. Let's consider the first of these two things that we've been talking about. The Abrahamic covenant promises the advent of the Christ according to the flesh. To whom does this promise, this covenant promise belong? That the Christ will be born from your line. To whom does this promise belong? Who are the recipients? That, who has the covenant right to that promise? That the Christ will be born according to the flesh from this line. Well, it belongs to Abraham and his natural offspring, 
It belongs to the circumcision. It belongs to the Jews according to the flesh, all those who are circumcised. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, look at verses 25 and 26. Peter is speaking to a crowd of Jews. He looks out at his brethren according to the flesh, the Jews in Jerusalem, and he looks at them and he looks at this crowd and he says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Peter takes Genesis 12, 3 and Genesis 22, 18, and he says that you Jews, according to the flesh in Jerusalem before me today, you are the sons of that covenant. There is a promise in that covenant that belongs to you by virtue of being Abraham's children, according to the flesh. And what was the promise that they enjoyed? What was the promise that was given to them? It is that the Messiah will be born from among you. The Messiah will be born as one of you, and he will come to you first to bless you. Peter says that God raised up Jesus from among them and sent him to them to give them the blessing first. So here we have the same distinction between the advent of the one who blesses the raising up of the Christ, and the blessing that he himself brings. Peter ascribes the first privilege to the Jews according to the flesh. The Jews according to the flesh are the sons of the covenant in Genesis chapter 12, and it is their covenant heritage and inheritance that the Messiah will be born from their midst and will come to them first according to the flesh. It is their right as the circumcised people. It is their right as the children of Abraham that the Christ be of their line and bring the blessing to them first. Now turn over to Romans chapter 9. And look at verses 4 and 5. The children of Abraham, according to the flesh, have a right to the advent of the Messiah according to the flesh and the first announcement of his blessing or the first offer of his blessing. Paul speaks in the same way in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 to 5. Paul says, they, his his kinsmen according to the flesh, they are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, plural. This is so important. The covenants the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. If you're a child of Abraham, according to the flesh, if you are circumcised, what belongs to you by covenant right? Paul says a a multiplicity or multiple covenants. The covenants belong to those who are his kinsmen according to the flesh. And the advent of the Christ according to the flesh belongs to them. Now, when Paul says covenants in the plural, to them belong the covenants, what covenants is he talking about? What covenants belonged to the offspring of Abraham? Well, we have the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, And in some senses, the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant properly belongs to David's line only, but it rules over all the children of Abraham. So the Abrahamic, Mosaic, and Davidic covenant, these things belong to, pertain to, the children of Abraham according to the flesh. But the point that we must appreciate and that I want to emphasize strongly is that both Peter and Paul for, for both Peter and Paul, Genesis 12.3 or 22.18, this covenanted the advent of the Messiah according to the flesh to the children of Abraham according to the flesh. In you, Abraham, in your offspring, one from your line will 
will come into the world, and he will bless the nations. That's the, the first part of the, of the promise that I mentioned earlier. I said that the Abrahamic covenant promises basically two things. We could talk in much more detail, but it promises the advent of the Messiah according to the flesh, and it promises that this Messiah or this Christ will bring a blessing to the nations. And I'm going to argue that that blessing is the new covenant. So let's, let's ask the question, though. What is the blessing that the Christ brings or that the offspring of Abraham brings to the world? Peter already stated it in Acts chapter 3 and verse 26. He said to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The blessing of the Christ is to turn people from sin, to turn people from wickedness, to deal with their sinfulness. Paul explains this further in Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 and 14. I'll read those to you. Paul says in Galatians 3, 8, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So Paul looks at Genesis 12, 3 and 22, 18, and he says this is announcing ahead of time the just justification by faith for the Gentiles, justification by faith for all the nations of the earth. So the blessing that the Messiah brings is justification received freely by faith. And then Paul later says in Galatians 3, 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The nations believe in the Christ and they are justified and receive the Holy Spirit. This is the blessing that the Christ brings. This is the blessing that the offspring of Abraham brings into the world for the world. What covenant deals with sin, removes sin, justifies its people, and gives them the Holy Spirit? These are precisely the promises of the new covenant. Therefore, the Abrahamic covenant promises the advent of the Christ according to the flesh, the one who will bless. And the Christ brings about the new covenant, which blesses the nations and gives them forgiveness and justification and the Holy Spirit received freely by faith, not, as Paul says in Galatians, through the works of the law. When we understand these two simple points, the promise of the advent of the Christ according to the flesh and the promise of the blessing that he brings, which is the new covenant, it gives a great deal of clarity to biblical texts and related theological questions. So think with me about how this understanding of the Abrahamic covenant makes sense of really the argument of the entire Bible. That's such a, a huge claim and impossible to defend sufficiently in half a lecture. But just think through the, the argumentation, think through the logic with me and the arguments of um, the apostles, especially Jesus and the apostles. John the Baptist and Jesus and the apostles consistently teach that the Christ belongs to the Jews by virtue of their Abrahamic paternity. Because God had covenanted with the offspring of Abraham that one of them would come to bless the world. And so therefore, when that one arrives, he belongs to the Jews according to the flesh as one of their brethren. But John the Baptist and Jesus and the apostles consistently teach that when the Messiah comes, when the Christ comes, the only way to receive his blessing, that is the new covenant, is through faith in the Christ who dies and rises from the dead. And they taught that this blessing is freely given to the whole world without regard for descent from Abraham or obedience to Moses. Everyone who receives the dead and risen Christ by faith, Jew or Gentile, will, will inherit from him, will receive from him the forgiveness of their sins, justification by faith, and the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. 
excuse me. Who is it that will receive the new covenant and kingdom of Christ? John the Baptist says it's not the children of Abraham according to the flesh, but rather it's the ones who do the works of Abraham, namely believing. Jesus used parables like the workers of the last hour and the prodigal son to make this point. In Matthew chapter 20, in the parable of the workers of the last hour, they receive the same payment as the ones who bore the brunt of the heat and the labor of the day. And Jesus says, these ones who have come last will be first. And what happens in that parable? The workers who worked all day in the heat of the day, they're upset. They say, how can it be that the the workers of the last hour receive the same salary, the same blessing that, that we have worked hard for, that we have endured much in order to receive? Jesus says, The steward, the master of these things, can do as he pleases. Why are you upset? You should rather be saying, look how magnanimous, look how benevolent, look how beneficent the steward is who is giving such a wonderful uh, payment, who is giving such a wonderful blessing or salary to the workers of the last hour. If God wants to be merciful and gracious to these, why should you be upset? But, But the parable obviously is saying that the Jews who have lived under the law of Moses... They think that others should have to live under the law of Moses too. Whereas the master is saying, no, you don't have to bear the brunt of the heat of the day. You don't have to to live under that yoke in order to receive the blessing. The same blessing will be given to all. But it's the workers of the day who resent and hate those who come in at the last hour. So also, in the prodigal son, it's the son who remains in the father's house who resents and hates the prodigal son who receives mercy and grace at the end and leaves, the son leaves the house. The firstborn, the the son who remains with the father, he leaves. He doesn't want to be in the feast. He says, "I, I don't want a part of this because he shouldn't be here. The parable of the workers of the last hour and the parable of the prodigal son, these things are about the mystery of Christ. They're about the relation of the Jews to the blessing for the nations. They don't like the fact that the lawless son received mercy. They don't like the fact that the workers of the last hour received the same blessing. And all of these are these parables about the, the workers of the last hour or the prodigal son, they fit in with the larger biblical theology or typology of the first and second son, or the typology of the first and last. Cain killed Abel, Ishmael persecuted Isaac, Esau hunted Jacob, Saul persecuted David. Again and again in the Old Testament, in the unfolding, one of the threads of of the unfolding mystery of Christ is that the first will persecute the second. The first will reject the second. And so when Jesus teaches the parable of the, the workers of the last hour or the prodigal son, it's simply one more example of prophetic revealing of the mystery of Christ and how the Jews will stumble over the stumbling stone and reject it and hate the Gentiles because of it. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul says that Jews according to the flesh who reject the, the Messiah and persecute the church are Ishmael. He calls Jews according to the flesh who persecute the church and hate it, he says they are Ishmael. In Romans 9, Paul says that the Jews who reject the Messiah are Esau. We often appeal to Romans 9 as as an argument for election regarding salvation, but it is first and foremost about Israel and and the nations, Israel and the Gentiles, that God had in his wisdom so arranged things that some of the Jews would reject the Christ. And they are designated for destruction. They are Esau. But God preserved a remnant of the Jews who would receive the Christ by faith along with the Gentiles. And they are Jacob. Now, can you imagine being a son of Abraham, circumcised according to the flesh? Can you imagine being a son of Abraham and hearing from an apostle of the church of Jesus Christ that you are Ishmael and you are Esau? Can you imagine anything more provocative to a Jew, it, it, will, it will manifest something. If they are the elect of God, they will repent of their sins and, and embrace the Christ by faith. But if they, are, if they are passed over by God, then what will they do? It, this will inflame in them a hatred. How dare you 
But what did Esau do? He sold his birthright, just like the workers of the last hour don't want anything to do with the, with the workers who bore the brunt of the heat of the day don't want anything to do with the workers of the last hour. The, the son who remained in the father's house leaves the feast and doesn't want to be there with the, the prodigal son and the fatted calf. So also the, the Jews sell their birthright. Jesus says they reject the kingdom. It's taken away from them. He came to them to bless them with the new covenant and his kingdom first. It was brought to them according to the flesh to the Jew first. And they rejected it. They stumbled over the the stone of offense laid in Zion. Paul says in Romans 9 to 11, it was destined that this was going to happen. And yet God will use this to bring about the distribution of the gospel to the nations. So Genesis 12, 3, and you shall the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 22, 18, and your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed. We find that the way in which that will actually play out includes a majority, a large portion of the Israelite nation itself actually being condemned and their condemnation leading to the blessing coming to the nations. And Paul concludes in Romans 11 saying, who could have understood this? Who can understand the mind of the Lord who would work in history in such a way to weave together uh, revelation in the Old Testament as well as history itself to bring about what we are now seeing in fullness, the mystery unveiled. Paul glorifies God. The Apostle John says that Jesus came to his own. Jesus came to his own because in Genesis 12 and 22, what is promised to the Jews according to the flesh? The advent of the Christ. He is theirs. He belongs to them as a brother. But then John says, they did not receive him. His own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, to those who received the Christ by faith, what did he give them? He gave them the blessings of the new covenant, the right to be called a son of God. It's the same thing that Peter said in Acts chapter 3. God raised him up first to bless you first by turning you from your wickedness. A remnant of them, according to God's prophetic promise, turn to the Christ and are incorporated into his covenant and kingdom. And the rest are passed over and reject him. Paul says that I too am a part of that remnant. God has preserved a remnant for himself in Israel. And so God covenanted with the Jews according to the flesh first in Israel and then in Samaria, the the southern and northern kingdoms. And after the gospel had gone from Jerusalem to Samaria, after the kingdom of Israel was given the covenant and kingdom of Christ and the elect were gathered in it, then it went out to the nations. Now the blessing for all the nations will be sent out through the apostles and the church. For the Jew first, yes, but now for the Gentiles. These two, these two passages, Acts chapter 3 and Romans 9, are extremely important and foundational for our understanding of the nature of the Abrahamic covenant and its relation to the mystery of Christ. Peter says, you are the sons of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And in Romans 9, they are Israelites, and to them belong the covenants. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Or as Paul said in Ephesians 2, Dr. Barcelos mentioned this, that the Gentiles were strangers to the covenants of the promise, the covenants that were declaring the Christ yet to come. Now, where many have gone too far is in thinking that because the Abrahamic covenant announces the coming of the Christ and his covenant and his kingdom, that therefore the Abrahamic covenant is the new covenant, but in a previous form. And as one would expect, because they're not making things up, they're arguing from scripture, they would appeal to passages like Romans 4 and Galatians 3, where Paul appeals to God's dealings with Abraham uh, to prove his points. But I want to point out that Romans 4 and Galatians 3 will not contradict what we have seen in Acts chapter 3 or Romans 9. And a proper understanding of Galatians 3 and uh, Galatians 3 and Romans 4 depends greatly on what questions one thinks Paul is answering. 
or what issues one thinks Paul is addressing. Now, how many interpretations are there of what Paul is trying to address in Galatians and Romans? As many commentaries as there are, that's how many interpretations there are. They're greatly debated and disputed passages, certainly. But I would contend that in Romans 4 and Galatians 3, just as in nearly everything else Paul writes, he is explaining the unveiling of the mystery of Christ. Protestants tend to read these passages in terms of ordo salutis, in terms of soteriology. And no doubt they do have much, they have much to do with soteriology. But much of what Paul is doing in Romans 4, Four and Galatians 3 and most of his other writings, a lot of it has to do with Historia Salutis, with explaining the unveiling of the mystery of Christ and what this means. And so the soteriological implications come after the explanation of the unfolding of history according to God's plan. Far too often people read Paul as making dogmatic points when he is making historical points. To be specific, In Galatians chapter 3, Paul argues that because Genesis 12.3 and 22.18 promised that a descendant of Abraham would bless the nations, and because this is simply promised without regard to anything else, and because this predates the giving of the Mosaic law, therefore the blessing for the Gentiles does not come through the keeping of the Mosaic law. And because God had covenanted to Abraham that a descendant would bless the nations, pure and simple, the Mosaic covenant which comes later does not alter this. It does not change this. It does not detour from this preceding covenantal promise. The blessing, Paul says, comes through hearing with faith, receiving Christ and his covenant by faith. And so what is, what is the consequence? The consequence is that if the Galatians or anyone else accepts the Mosaic law as abiding and obligatory, then they are are in effect saying that the blessing has not yet come. Because that is effectively a denial of Jesus Christ and a denial of the validity of the apostles and the church. If God promised that the blessing for the nations would come through hearing by faith, or by faith through hearing, for the whole world, and that the Mosaic law was a means of preparing the world for this, preparing the Jews and the world for this, then if we are still in the stage of Mosaic law keeping, the world is still being prepared for something that has not yet come. And so to continue to observe the laws of Moses is a denial that the Christ has come according to the flesh, which is a denial that Jesus is the Christ, which is a denial that the church is a legitimate entity, which is a denial of Christianity. This is the same argument that I believe Paul makes in Hebrews. That if you go back to the animal sacrifices, if you go back to the the Levitical priests, then you are saying that Jesus is not the Christ who is promised to come. And the covenant that he brought is a false covenant. It's all false. If you go back to the shadow, you are saying that the substance has not yet come. Paul is telling the Galatians... Don't return, as he says in Colossians, don't return to these shadows. Don't go back to these things. They were preparatory. They were were temporary. They had a purpose. And that purpose was not to deviate from God's plans. No, God had always promised in Genesis 12 and Genesis 22 to bless the nations freely. You don't have to obey the law of Moses to receive what God has promised to do freely for mankind. And so if you accept the law of Moses as a precondition for that, you don't understand the purpose of the law or the nature of what God had intended and promised to do. However, though the Abrahamic covenant promised the free blessing for the nations, and though Abraham and others believed in that blessing to come, it does not therefore follow that the Abrahamic covenant is the new covenant. Galatians 3 and Acts 3 must agree. The Abrahamic covenant promises the birth of the Christ according to the flesh, and the Christ brings the new covenant. And all who receive him and his covenant by faith, Jew or Gentile, are equal heirs of the glories won by the Messiah. So Paul makes the argument in Galatians 3 that because Genesis 12 precedes the law, 
because God promised from the beginning to freely bless the Gentiles. Therefore, you know that the Mosaic law does not detour from this or become a precondition for receiving that blessing. It's, a, it's an argument based on timing. Paul makes a similar argument based on timing in Romans 4, where he says that because the free blessing for the nations and Abraham's faith are announced prior to the institution of circumcision, circumcision will not be in opposition to those things. Circumcision cannot be thought of as contrary or opposed to the idea of blessing the nations freely. No, Paul says, rather, circumcision was an outward, visible confirmation of the righteousness that would come to the uncircumcision. Think of it like this. God promises to Abraham, God covenants to Abraham, in your offspring, from your people, will come one who blesses the nations. That, will, that blessing will be, will be received freely by faith. And then God says, I'm going to mark this people from whom the Christ will come to bless the nations. I'm going to mark them with circumcision. So that you know, in the rest of history, until the Christ comes, the circumcised people, who are they? They are the people who will bring about the blessing for the nations. So if you think of circumcision as anything that opposes the inclusion of the Gentiles and the free blessing of the Gentiles, you don't understand what circumcision was a visible marker of. That's Paul's argument in Romans chapter 4. Unfortunately, our, our Pado baptist brethren misunderstand this and our English translations are not very good because they think of circumcision as the seal of, of the faith, the righteousness of faith that Abraham had in his uncircumcision, but that's reading a good deal into the text. It says it, it was a seal, it's a visible marker, a visible confirmation of the righteousness which one obtains by faith that was to be for the uncircumcision, for the Gentiles. God promised that the Gentiles will receive justification freely in the Messiah who is born from the Abrahamic line, and God marked that Abrahamic line with circumcision. So circumcision is a public identifier. It's a public confirmation that the blessing for the nations will come from this people. So if the Jews glory in circumcision to the, op to the exclusion of the Gentiles, or if the Jews have any self-conception, self-identity that is contrary to the inclusion of the Gentiles, they misunderstand why they were marked in the first place. Why do we exist as a nation from the beginning, from Genesis 12, to bless the nations? So when the Christ comes to bless the nations and the workers of the last hour receive the same salary, Jews, don't be upset. This is why God called us. This is our very purpose. This is our birthright. This is our privilege to be the first recipients of the gospel and to join with the Gentiles in the covenant and Christ and the covenant and kingdom of the Christ. The Jews cannot object to what the Christ has come and done. It was promised. It was declared. It was woven into their covenants. They cannot object to the church, this entity that gathers all peoples freely on the basis of faith in the Christ. Nor can they object to the dismantling of their own kingdom and covenants because the very dismantling of those things means the Christ has come. And what more could they want? What more could they want than the coming, the advent of the Christ and his covenant and his kingdom? And so if circumcision is nothing, if the sacrifices are nothing, if the Levitical priesthood is disassembled, if the Davidic kingship is now confirmed in a, in a greater and other kingdom, what more could they want? This is, this is the destination, the telos of the law, as Paul says. Israel never existed with any other purpose than to bring the Christ to the world and to join him with the world in a new covenant on the basis of faith. So this is where we would disagree with, or one of the places in which we would disagree with our dispensational brethren, who though dear brethren in the Lord, see the Israelite kingdom and the kingdom of Christ as having distinct and potentially parallel destinations. Whereas the kingdom and covenants of, of, the, of, the, of Israel are designed to terminate in the kingdom and covenant of Jesus Christ. This is the mystery of Christ. And so the Jews are called to join all the workers together in the same salary, all the, in, all the invitees to the same wedding feast. There's not a distinct and separate destiny for Israel as a people according to the flesh, because their purpose as a people according to the flesh was to bring forth the Messiah, who then gathers the Jews and the world 
in the new covenant and kingdom that he brought through his suffering and subsequent glory. This is the meaning of Paul's analogy in Romans 11. The Christ is the vine. The natural branches received him by virtue of their natural descent from Abraham. There is a natural relationship between a Jew according to the flesh and the Christ. He came to his own. Peter, Acts 3, you are the sons of this covenant. The Christ is the center of Romans 11 and and the vine. The natural branches were, were connected to him according to the flesh. But what did John the Baptist and Jesus say? The axe is laid to the root. Those who do not do the works of Abraham, namely believing, those who do not receive the Christ but reject him, John chapter 1, they are cut off. Your natural connection to Christ according to the flesh is insufficient to give you a place in his covenant and his kingdom. Rather, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And you must receive the dead and risen Messiah by faith. And so Paul says those who receive him by faith are grafted in. They now have a relation to the Christ of a different kind. Again, not new in history because Abraham believed, because so many others believed, and that's where two-level typology plays such an important role. But for now, we're talking about the fact that In Romans 11, it's the mystery of Christ that's being explained. Again and again and again, Paul is explaining the mystery of Christ. In Ephesians 3, 1 to 12, Paul says, that's my job. That's what I do. Sadly, our paedo-baptist brethren often take these two different relationships, Israel according to the flesh, related to the Christ according to the flesh, and The Israel of God, the eschatological Israel, what Israel was supposed to be and should be, those who do the works of Abraham and, and receive the Christ by faith, they take these as two levels of the same covenant, where you are born into it according to the flesh, but then you must close with Christ. You must believe in him in order to receive the blessings of the covenant. But I thought you were already in the covenant. No, you see, they've taken two different covenants and two different kinds of relationship to Christ and conflated them into one. They've taken the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant and made them the same same covenant now with two different kinds of membership. And yes, there are two different kinds of relation to the Christ, but one is Abraham's offspring according to the flesh and those who do the works of Abraham and he is their father by example, namely all believers. The Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant are not the same covenant. Think about the logic of difference in substance from yesterday. What makes covenants distinct in substance when their promises and their effects are different? Are the, are the promises and effects of the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant distinct? They both promise the Christ, but on different terms. And we can tell that by the effects. The Abrahamic covenant engenders children according to the flesh, who are then circumcised and must keep the law of Moses. That's the effect natural children, the brothers of the Messiah according to the flesh. The effect that the Abrahamic covenant produces is what Paul says in Galatians, children born into bondage. Because circumcision obliges you, obligates you to keep the whole law. The marked people of Abraham, marked by circumcision, must keep all the laws of Moses. The Abrahamic covenant produces children according to the flesh, but it produces the Messiah according to the flesh. The new covenant What does it do? It causes children to be born from above. It causes children to be born from heaven because they receive the Christ by faith. And so the same Christ is promised in these two covenants, but in different ways, distinct ways. The Christ is promised according to the flesh. In your offspring will all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And then the Messiah himself brings the new covenant. Receive the Christ, receive me by faith, and all that I have all that I have done and won. To bring this to a conclusion, I want to combine various strands of thought. What I want to say is let the Abrahamic covenant be the Abrahamic covenant. Acts chapter 3, you are the sons of Genesis 12. Romans 9, to them belong the covenants. To them, 
Notice the otherness of that language. To, the kin- to my kinsmen according to the flesh, to the Israelites. They are Israelites, Paul says, and to them belong the covenants. Peter, Acts 3, you are the sons of Genesis 12. Let the Abrahamic covenant be the Abrahamic covenant. They are circumcised. The people who will bring about the Messiah according to the flesh in order to bless the nations. And until he comes, they will live under the law of Moses in the land of Canaan. All of this is developing the mystery of Christ because the kingdom and covenants of Israel provide a typological context wherein the mission of the Messiah makes perfect sense. When he comes and offers himself as a substitutionary sacrifice, how is it that that is legible and understandable to the world? Well, it's because all of the typology of the sacrificial and Levitical system that had been going on for centuries prior, as well as the typology of the Davidic kingship and everything else that was in Israel. It provided, Israel provided the perfect context for the Christ to come, his mission to make sense, and then to take the blessing to the world through his apostles and his church. Let the Abrahamic covenant be the Abrahamic covenant. It is not the covenant that blesses the world. It brings about the Christ who brings the covenant that blesses the world. This does not at all commit the Anabaptist error of divesting the Old Testament of the grace of the new covenant. Why? Because the grace of the new covenant is announced from Genesis 3.15 onward. And the dealings of God with Abraham and the Jews is all subserving this, promoting this, working together again and again. I want to repeat that Israel and its covenants and its kingdom are not doing something else in history. They're not about something else. We may distinguish two levels of typology, but it's all about the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, 1 to 12, an eternal plan and purpose, which was revealed in the ages prior, but is now revealed in fullness. There is a unity to God's revelation in redemptive history, or as Dr. Bar- Barcelos referenced in the previous lecture, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12, the same spirit who spoke through the po- prophets is speaking through the apostles now, the same message, the grace that was destined to be yours, Peter says, was announced ahead of time. So although we let the Abrahamic covenant be the Abrahamic covenant, we are not divesting the Old Testament of the grace of the new covenant. What was it that God promised to Abraham? The Christ who brings the new covenant. Paul is at pains again and again to show that the children according to the flesh should not oppose the children according to the spirit. First, because there were many Jews who believed, like their father Abraham. And second, Because who is more natural to receive the gospel and believe it than the Jews who had all of these privileges? What advantage then hath the Jew? Much in every regard. Who had more than them? Who knew more than them? Who had seen more than them? Who received the ministry of the Christ? It was them. As Peter said, God raised him up to bless you first. The children of Israel should have received the Christ But because the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant are not the same covenant, because the Abrahamic covenant produces children according to the flesh to bring about the Messiah to bless the world, and because the new covenant brings about children born according to the Spirit, born from above, who receive the blessing of the Christ for the world, this is one of the fundamental reasons why circumcision and baptism will never be the same thing. Paul says that circumcision was a public confirmation of the promise that there would be a free blessing for the nations. If they're marked with circumcision, it's because they're going to bring about the Christ for the world. And therefore, once the Christ comes, what is circumcision? It is nothing. There's no need to mark a people from whom the Messiah will be born because he has been born. The promise of which circumcision was the visible marker has been fulfilled. Once the Abrahamic covenant gives birth to the new covenant, it ceases. It has fulfilled its function. The mystery is unveiled. The new has come and makes the old obsolete. To continue to circumcise as obedience to the Abrahamic covenant would mean that the Christ has not yet come. The same argument is made with regard to sacrifices, as I mentioned earlier. To continue to sacrifice means that Christ's sacrifice has not yet been offered. Now, to connect this to infant baptism directly and briefly, 
I find the standard and common Reformed covenantal argument for infant baptism very strange. What I mean by that is that if, if the older justification for it is used, if baptism is regarded as effective for purifying original sin, then infant baptism makes sense by virtue of the efficacy of the sacrament itself. It will purify my child. It will, it will remove their original sin. Okay, that, that makes, it has its own logic. I don't agree. But the Reformed reject, most of them, reject the true foundation of infant baptism and have instead appealed to a defunct Israelite covenant. If the Reformed baptize their children because they are in the covenant, thinking that the Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of grace, but insist that there's no efficacy in it, what are they doing? They're marking a people according to the flesh. And if you ask our Reformed brothers what baptism accomplishes for their children, the standard Reformed response is that the promise is for them, but that's not an answer. If that's an indefinite gospel offer, then the covenant of grace is made with the world on the same condition. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. The promise is for the nations. So if, if, bapt, if infant baptism is, we, we are in the new phase of the Abrahamic covenant, baptism has replaced cir circumcision as the new administration, we continue to baptize our children because they are in the covenant, Children were marked with circumcision, waiting for the Christ to come. Children are marked with baptism. They were once marked with baptism to purify their original sin. Now they're marked with baptism. Why? Because, you see, what is the benefit that they receive? What is the purpose for this? Baptism, in a credo-baptist understanding, marks the people who have been born again. Marks of people who have received the grace of the new covenant. But the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant are not the same thing. Circumcision and baptism are not the same thing. Israel and the church are not the same thing. That needs more and better explanation in our circles. The apostles did not say to the Jews, we were in the covenant of grace the whole time and you just didn't know it. Now it's a new administration. No, they say we were given the great privilege of being the brothers of the Messiah according to the flesh and bringing him to the world. And we were given the great privilege of receiving the new covenant first. So join him, all Jews, my brethren according to the flesh, Peter or Paul would say, join him and the Gentiles in the new covenant. We were the sons of the covenant God made with our fathers in Genesis 12. Let us all, with the Gentiles, join in the new covenant with the Christ and the nations of the world, freely received by faith. This brings us back where we began to Ephesians chapter 3. That which was revealed in former ages as a mystery has now been realized, unveiled, and declared. God has always had one eternal plan and purpose. And the Israelite covenants and kingdoms subserved this purpose directly by bringing forth the Messiah and providing a context in which his mission would be legible. And when he came, he called his own to join him in a new kingdom through a new covenant with the rest of the world. And the beauty of the gospel, brothers and sisters, is that we continue to proclaim that same kingdom received through that same covenant to the world. Paul says in Colossians, the mystery of Christ is Christ in you. Talking to Gentile Greeks, to Colossians. The mystery of Christ is Christ in us. And every time we preach the gospel here in our pagan nations, strangers to the covenants of the promise, it is a further fulfillment of the mystery of Christ as the new covenant continues to bless the nations and collect them in the church. One covenant and one kingdom of one Christ. We have embraced Jesus by faith. We have received the Spirit by, through hearing by faith. And we go to the world to offer them, Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile, to offer to the world the same free, full, and final forgiveness in the dead and risen Christ. The mystery has been unveiled. Praise God.